selected screen to share. Can you see my slides? Okay. Right, well, well, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for inviting me to be part of this. Um, Jason kind of gave me a lesson on how to share your slides yesterday. I seem to have got it right so far. Um, if you can see my, let, let me start with the first slide. Do you now see my first slide? Do I need to go to slide presentation? Yes, uh, you, you can do either way. You, you can do presentation or you can just uh, scroll down. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, I've got a few. I've got a few slides with with simple diagrams and then a few words, which I'm going to talk around and try and stay within the, the limit. Thankfully, both um, Jason and, and Martin have said much that um, I don't have to repeat, and that we, we seem to be in large agreement about many things, not everything, but many things. So I'm going to say something about cybernetics gen in general, and then I'm going to uh, mention beliefs and science and what makes science uh, distinct. And then I'm going to say something about the conversation, particularly the conversations between observers, uh, who to me are, are systems that um, uh, observers are observing systems and they talk to each other. We'll come to that. Okay. Um, first, with this is just to remind that the the innocent who may not have seen, seen this before, we have first and second order cybernetics, where first order cybernetics is the subjects observe systems. Second order subjects is subjects observing systems. Now, von Furstner made this distinction in 1974, almost in a throwaway remark in the cybernetics of cybernetics collection he compiled with the students. And I believe Stuart Umpleby had the honor of being the first person to write any commentary about second order cybernetics. Uh, but uh, some, some years later, von Furstner noted that um, Prior to him, in 1969, Pass, Gordon Pask had made a distinction between taciturn systems, which are basically systems we, we, we observe as observed systems, um, taciturn, they don't speak, and language-oriented systems, systems with whom we have conversations. Uh, and the point is, we, you know, we, we could have a human being on a, on a um, dissecting table and say, well, that's an observed system. But if the human being is alive, we may choose to speak to her or not. So these are observer made distinctions. So at this point I'm saying an observer is a language oriented observing system. So now we know my idea what an observer is. Um, then we have a, a classic combination of theorems from um, Umberto and Heinz von Furster. Everything that is said is said by or to an observer. So immediately this puts us into a, uh, a conversation with other observers and it, it doesn't allow us to have any uh, other authority than what we are saying to each other in our conversations. There's no external authority for, to be had from books uh, and unless we agree it there's no uh, observed domain uh, to, to refer to. Uh, and then the final statement there to remind us that we're talking about as observing systems, systems that are autopoietic or equivalently they're organizationally closed self-organizing and as such um, they construct or model the environment inform themselves of the environment uh, by interacting with it and um, uh, having per perturbations that's the best thing perturbations and they, they construct their understanding environment from by interpreting the the perturbations so that science is famous statement. The environment contains the information, it is as it is. Everything else is constructed by the observer, or the observing system. And at this point we know that all living systems are observing systems, that observers are the particular characters that language together, as much of our put it, human beings generally. Although some people language with their pussy cats and so on. It's, a, it's the observer's distinction. Now this is a very, simple diagram, but it, I try, it tries to get the point of distinction between um, the second order turn where the observer starts to observe herself. So we start with the observer as the eye at the, at the, at the top of the uh, slide, and we follow clockwise. Here we have the first order study of observed systems. 
the observer distinguished systems that are, and while observing these observed systems, as any observer might or a scientist might, the observer distinguishes systems that are energetically open and organizationally closed or autobiotic. Well, that's interesting. You know, this is the general class of living systems or autobiotic systems. And he goes on to observe them some more, and he notices that they, uh, they, they've evolved, they evolved, and that uh, individual systems are subject to ontogenetic development. You know, they go from infants to adults, uh, and they become systems that observe in their own right. They themselves become observing systems, and they converse amongst themselves. So this is a, still in this kind of naive realist view, just looking at the world as we see it. And then we come to nine o'clock, this is where the observer acknowledges that she is just such a, a system, uh, a self-organizing system, autopilotic system. So it now becomes um, the second order study of observing systems where, as I like to put it, the observer explains herself to herself. So we've done this second order turn. So next time round the circle, we're no longer naive realists. We are, if you like, constructivists, but we are second order cyberneticians. I hope that makes sense. It's supposed to be similar. And then we note from, mainly from Heinz, that the, the observer is responsible for the world that she constructs or distinguishes or observes, however you want to put it. And that um, the observer should enter the domain of her own description, that knowledge that she is an observing system that she can observe herself, she can carry out second order observation of observers, including herself. And that, uh, just a brief mention of this, that the observers are responsible for, or chooses the answers to what Heinz refers to, in principle, undecidable questions. I think it's a very nice uh, um, um, thesis of Heinz, that there are undecidable questions, there are unknowables, uh, there are undecidable questions. And it gives us an example, um, you know, the Big Bang, no one knows what happened before the Big Bang. In fact, no one knows what happened out of the Big Bang because no one was there to observe it. All we're talking about are hypotheticals. The actual truth of the matter is an undecidable question. And someone might come and say, well, there is a God, I believe in God. And someone says, no, there isn't. So we're dealing with undecidable questions. And I just notice it's the real freedom of an observer is what answers we choose to give to undecidable questions. So that's just a, a back to the theme of, of science. Um, this is, uh, this diagram, this model is actually taken from uh, a couple of books by Nicholas Rescher. I don't know if you know Nicholas Rescher, he's a, generally a philosopher, he's a philosopher, but mainly he's written about science, philosophy of science. Uh, and uh, in the early 90s, he wrote two books um, conceptual idealism and methodological pragmatism and taking ideas, he admits he took ideas from systems theory and from Jean Piaget to come up with this construction. It's very similar to some of the things that uh, Jason and, and, and Martin have already talked about, but I, I, I particularly like this one. We have two cycles. Um, the outer cycle is the Y cycle, where it says at the bottom correction by coherence. In the box at the top, it says metaphysical assumptions, theoretical interpretation, conceptual systems. It's a general idea of conceptualization, uh, theorizing, however you want to call it, in a, explaining why. Um, what's your theory? What's your, your concepts? And uh, with respect to science, um, uh, Rescher points out that in th this realm of the theory, the ideas, the concepts, the assumptions, we have correction by coherence. And it gives a nice thesis about how logical systems have evolved from kind of Aristotle onwards to modern day very sophisticated thought about, about logic and mathematics indeed. And then the smaller cycle, uh, the how cycle, this is the domain of models, methods, procedures, application into the domain of interest. And where following the application, we get pragmatic correction as to whether our, our models are are, are, are correct, our methods work, our procedures work, and this is the testability domain that emphasized by, by Karl, Karl Popper. So this is pragmatic correction. And it's the operation of these two cycles together that uh, makes science work, 
and the, the key thing that about about this cycle when these two cycles when they work clearly together is that um, science is convergent if the scientists follow these criteria of logical of logic and evidence then science begins to 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 um, converge to a consensus now I also use this this diagram this model of pressures as a general model for systems of belief where I point out that instead of being scientists there are many many people who make assumptions adopt dogmatic beliefs in the Y cycle you know they they refer to some authoritative text or some authoritative teacher and they take on a belief system and in the house cycle instead of being involved in pragmatic correction as a scientist would be they just obey the rituals they follow the rules and the test is are you following the rules properly are you carrying out the rituals exactly as the text prescribed so here we have we can use this as a general model for any belief system but lacking the uh, the criteria that makes it science so um i quite i quite like that i think it's useful to see what uh, um what are not uh, scientific belief systems at this point it's worth echoing what jason said about uh, about science in a recent paper on furster in defending his own approach he says he is a scientist he works from facts and develops arguments he means facts about how uh, biological systems work you know they are molecular auto autobiotic systems so he said that's science and he develops his, 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 his ideas from those facts he says the problem with philosophy is that philosophers begin by taking up a position a set of ideas some assumptions which they then conserve in their languaging in other words they, they, they adopt a position which they then defend by appealing to arguments authorities and whatever they can uh, and it's not it doesn't it's not as tight if you like as the um the, the way science works but the way to detect that you you're not dealing you, you're dealing with something which is not science is such these belief systems philosophical religious whatever you want to call them diverge wherever you find a, a, a non-scientific belief system you'll find divergent views schisms so and i've i've i coined some years ago i coined, I coined the aphorism isms lead to schisms okay so i don't i, I don't actually like the word constructivism because it's you know it's, it's a philo philosophic concept really and you get a lot of divergent views coming out of that let's stay with the science let's stay with second order cybernetics um on to the next bit so I'm, I'm coming into um i want to talk about um conversation between observers and then i'll, I'll be finished shortly now this is um uh, a simple model of, of, of what past calls a, a psychological individual uh, if you if you look it's actually isomorphic to the Rescher model it's got the why the reproduction of, of truth by coherence at the top I've, I've copied that from Russia and then we've got uh, uh, concepts applied which is the how um, point about this is that there's a system of concepts which is uh, constitutes the, the P individual and the P individual is an embodied it's embodied it's not some um, floating around system it's past makes an, an analytic distinction between the psychological system and the the biological system that embodies it so we're, we're looking at a system of beliefs the conceptual system of an individual you've got them i've got them and pass so that's that's the idea there but he points out that this the systems of, 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 are they're also organizationally closed we apply codes they evolve they change they modify they're actually multiple in our inner conversations but they are what i would now refer to because psychological individual can be a bit um, odd for people. I call them psychosocial individuals. And if we go on to the next one, this is my penultimate slide. Um, this is again, this is again from past. He calls this the skeleton of the conversation. And here he's just talking about teaching and learning. But the idea is we've got two participants in the conversation. Here the teacher, the learner. And we've got a Y level where 
explanation, like, uh, theoretical ideas, conceptual ideas exchange, and at how level, where um, how to do things, method, method, methodologies, if you like, methods, and so on, are uh, discussed and exemplified using a modeling facility, which may be, uh, you know, the real world domain. For example, you may, you may take your students on a field trip to demonstrate the theses that you're presenting to them about living systems and so on. So it's a very general uh, representation of what happens in conversation if, you, if you're strict about explaining your ideas and demonstrating your ideas, exp exemplifying your ideas using some kind of modern facility. But at this point, we can see that we have uh, the, the beginnings of a community of observers. And right from 1960, with Heinz in his first paper on self organized systems, says um, communities, of this, co communities of observers come together. We're not, he says, we're self organizing systems, therefore we are constructing our realities. But to get away from being solipsists, solipsists we are communities who, who make um, concept, who come to consensual, consensual agreements. And that's the, the hallmark of scientists. They make the con these consensual agreements about the nature of reality, albeit we often agree to disagree. So let's jump, well, I've nearly finished. And this is just an example, I came across this very recently. As you know, in modern physics, there's all sorts of things being discussed. Um, dark matter, um, I, I, occasionally I look at this stuff. I, I stopped looking at it in any detail years ago, but um, um, multiple universes, um, what happened before the Big Bang, who knows? But there's a, a recently formed, society by some uh, by some physicists most of them are quite respectable systems called the they call it the key cycle or key cycle society and you can go and have a look at the keycycle.com and they're they're starting out a campaign to insist that physics should only discuss things which are in principle testable and all the untestable yak 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 stuff about multiple realities and so on should be <laughs> abandoned or discarded as what it is pseudoscience so at that point that's my example of a community of scientists coming together to practice proper science and that's it i did note at the beginning i, I can't remember I did that cybernetics as uh, cybernetics was cybernetics cybernetics can come on, on any other dis discipline and how disciplines operate so it's a, it's a meta discipline and as such, we have cybernetics of cybernetics, and we can have cybernetics of science. We may as well call it science of science. So I'm very happy to have second order science. Jason, before we thank you, that's it. Thank you. Hang on, Jason. Hang on, Bernard. There was a question. Can you distinguish what you just said from what you heard from Jason and Robert? Uh, well, that, that's that would be too. Uh, well, J Jason made proposals about what we call an observer, uh, which I don't think are necessary. Um, both of them talked about science and the operation, the construction of this, that, and the other. And I think the simple diagrams I've used capture those points ex in a similar manner. So there's no real distinctions. Fundamentally, there's no real distinctions between our positions with respect to understanding how science works and the role that cybernetics has in understanding how science works. Is that good enough? Okay. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you.